one thing. Okay, so hi everybody, it's Danielle Damiano with Guaranteed Rates, and I am here today with Anita Cushy of Cushy Law Firm in Naples, Florida. Um, and we're here, we want to be your resource with everything that's going on um, in the world with mortgages and with COVID-19 and with people out of work and things like that. So we're here live on Facebook to answer your questions um, and to also discuss a lot of questions that we're getting, um, me from my mortgage clients and Anita from her clients as an attorney. Um, so before we begin, I just want to introduce Anita and tell you a little bit about her. Um, she is with Cushy Law Firm. She is a resident of Naples, Florida, and has been for the past 22 years. Um, graduated from the uh, from UF, uh, University of Florida Law School, and she represents or she represents homeowners um, and defends them in foreclosure defense, um, short sales, loan modifications, and she also does um, protects them against predators and predators, um, as well as divorce and long term care. Did I miss anything? Well, that's all. That's okay, good. Um, and my name is Danielle Damianov. I am with Guaranteed Rate, um, VP of Mortgage Lending, licensed in the state of Florida and in Massachusetts, my hometown. Um, graduated from Bentley, or my home state. Graduated from Bentley and have been in mortgage and real estate since 2001. Um, have my mortgage broker license, my uh, real estate broker's license, and my real estate instructor's license. Um, so, we are here to answer a lot of the questions that we've been getting from our clients and just want to be a resource for everybody and, and make it as informative as possible. Um, and if anybody has questions that we're unable to get to, we will be sure to answer all of them um, after the Facebook Live um, in a one-on-one. -on -one. So, Anita, why don't you start if you want to tell us you know, anything about yourself or if you want to go right into the questions that you've been getting. Uh, sure, really quickly, I've been practicing law for 10 years. I've represented people both in foreclosure cases and trying to keep them out of foreclosure. So some of the questions related to the loans are very relevant for my clients. I still have a, a few of those cases, but the goal is to try and keep people out of foreclosures and make sure they keep their homes and save their homes. So, And uh, as Danielle says, any questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to answer one-on-one uh, -on -one questions. So I will start with one of the questions that people have a lot, Danielle, as far as how do you determine somebody's uh, interest rate when they apply for a loan? That's a really great question because a lot of times I'll get people call me and just say, what's the interest rate today? And they don't understand all of the different things um, that goes into it. And so when I take an application, I always tell people, you know, I'm looking at four main things, um, credit, income, assets, and debt ratio. And all four of those things are going to play into what the best loan program is and what the interest rate would be for the client. Um, what goes into an interest rate is a lot of different things. It's really going to depend on what the credit score is, um, what the loan to value is, the type of property, if it's a single family or a condo, there will be different interest rates um, for that. And then whether or not it's a primary residence, second home or investment property, um, you're gonna see higher interest rates on investment properties as opposed to a primary or a second home. Um, so there's a lot of different things that goes into interest rates and they're really gonna be based on that particular client and client situation. And do you sometimes tell clients to wait a little bit to reapply in case they are able to get a better interest rate by maybe improving their credit score or their income is going to increase because they're getting a new job in a few months? Yes. Um, so we'll, I'll talk about all of the different options, um, but that's a really great question. Sometimes, and especially right now, with lenders tightening their guidelines, credit score requirements are actually increasing. So more than ever right now, it's really important for people to, if they're wanting to get a home, buy a home or refinance, to make sure their credit is good because, um, you know, what we used to allow with the lower credit scores, most lenders are tightening up their guidelines and now requiring a higher credit score. Or with those lower scores, the interest rates are quite a bit higher. They're going to be higher, yes. Yeah. And how long does it take for a loan to be processed? 
We're actually really quick. Um, I just closed a VA loan in um, just under 20 days. And so, and that's a VA. Um, so our process is really quick. We can only move as fast as the client. So sometimes we have some complicated loans or complicated situations where there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of different things that have to happen. Um, but if somebody wants to close quick, I mean, we can really get a loan through the process in two weeks, um, two to three weeks. So yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, a great turnaround, yes. Yeah. So when people ask you, uh, what do you mean by points on a loan? Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, that's a really great question um, because a lot of times um, what I do is whenever I'm working with somebody, first of all, I'm not going to lock them in until I have a contract. And so what they have to realize is rates do change every day. So if I quote somebody a rate today and they don't get a contract for four weeks from now, the interest rate might be a little different, uh, but I always give them at least three options and I'll give them the par rate, which means they're not paying any points to get that rate. And then I'll also give them the rate if they want to buy the rate down. Some people like to buy the interest rate down and the way to do that is by charging points on the loan. Um, a point is 1% of the loan amount. So if we have a $200,000 loan amount, one point equals $2,000. Um, a lot of times where the misconception lies is they'll think, okay, well, if my rate is, let's just say 4% and I pay one point, it's going to go down to 3%, but it doesn't work like that. So I'll give them the different options. Um, this is your par rate, no points. This is if you pay a half of a point. This is if you pay one point. And then I'll also let them know how many years it will take them to break even if they do decide to pay the points. So I really try to figure out, you know, how long do they want to be in the house for? Is this a long-term investment? If it's an investment property, are they looking to cash flow? You know, what are they actually looking for? And I can help them determine what the best interest rate would be. Right. So you educate them to be able to make the best decision for them. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So we're in some difficult times right now. So can you talk about the advantages of refinancing during what's going on at this uh, time in our life? There's some incredible, so whenever someone comes to me for a refinance, if it doesn't make sense, I let them know right away. Like it just doesn't make sense for you. If someone bought six months ago, especially in the state of Florida, because in Florida our fees are higher than a lot of other states, mm -hmm. um, it might not make sense. But on the flip side, um, I actually just took somebody and am saving them almost $1,000 a month. Um, they have equity in their home. We're paying off some high interest debt. I'm also reducing um, their interest rate by a point and a half. Um, so we're able, we're able to give them the exact same monthly payment that they're paying right now. We're increasing their loan amount to pay off all of their debt. So if somebody has a lot of high interest debt and they do have equity in their home, it makes 100% sense to take that, um, you know, lower their interest rate and then pay off that high interest debt. And I, we're able to save a, some people a really good amount of money. Um, the other thing is, you know, if there is equity in the home, um, they can take some cash out and do different things for the home. Maybe they want to put in a pool. Maybe they want to take some money out to pay for their kid's college next year. Um, so there's a lot of advantages for that as well. With interest rates as low as they are, I mean, I locked a VA loan today under 3%. Um, so with interest rates as low as they are, it's really a no-brainer to either buy right now or refinance if you if you can. Yeah, that's a very low interest rate if you're below 3%. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so those are some of the advantages of being able to do the refinancing. What about some disadvantages? Some of the disadvantages are, you know, if it just doesn't make sense, if the home is not going to appraise, um, it, do, it wouldn't make sense, obviously, to go forward with the refinance. Mm -hmm. Or if you're trying to go from, let's just say, 4% to 3.75, you know, if you're not going to be in that home for a long time, it probably doesn't make sense to, you know, to refinance. It's just all going to depend on the situation. There definitely is our clients that will come to me and I'll say, you know, it might not make it might not make sense for you to refinance right now and here's why. I mean I only want to do make sure that we're doing what's absolute like in the best interest for the client. Excellent. 
So when people are purchasing home, oftentimes they hear that they have to put down 20%. Is that an absolute requirement for, uh, for a home buyer? That's a huge misconception um, because, you know, a lot of people still think they have to put down 20% and they don't. Um, we have programs with as little as 3% down um, for first time home buyers. Uh, primary residence is a 5% down payment. Um, second home is 10% and investment property um, 15, but you're going to get a better rate if you do 20 to 25. Um, now, if you don't put down 20%, you are going to have monthly mortgage insurance. There are some things that we can do to buy out the mortgage insurance um, so they don't have that monthly payment. And it just it's on a case by case where I'll look to see if it makes sense or not. The advantages of the mortgage insurance is being able to put down, you know, a lot less than that 20% because a lot of people don't have the 20% to put down. Right, that they still want to be a home a homeowner. Exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if they've purchased the home, but they want to pull some cash out because they want to do home improvements, are they able to? Are homeowners able to do that? Yeah. So we there's a couple of different options. Um, we can do a cash out refinance where we just go ahead and do the refinance and cut them a check at closing. Um, or we can do a renovation loan um, where the benefit of the renovation loans are that we get the plans and specs for what they're looking to do. And when the appraiser goes out to, the pro to appraise the property, he has the plans and specs of the home. And so he appraises the property as if the work was already done. Okay. The loan to value is based off of that appraisal. Um, and they're able to get, now it's not a check at closing, um, it's a very different process where we actually pay the contractors to do the work in draws. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a way to get more money because your home might not appraise for enough um, if, you know, if you don't do it that way. So. You don't do the improvements. So short sales were very popular back in 2009 and 2010. So if there is um, a home buyer that's um, looking to buy a house in short sale, what does that really mean for the home buyer nowadays? So I've had a couple of buyers buy short sales, and this is probably a question for you. So I'll get to your, you know, your part in a minute. But um, one thing to keep in mind if you are a buyer buying a short sale is you can make an offer on the property, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you're going to get it for. And it has to get approved by the bank. So on our side, on the mortgage side, um, it takes a little bit longer for the mortgage because we're waiting on the seller's bank to approve the short sale. Um, and now on the mortgage side as well, we're wanting to make sure that, you know, we're not gonna lock in an interest rate and then have to keep doing extensions because that gets ex uh, expensive. So we'll wanna make sure that we're moving forward and probably lock a rate once we're getting close to knowing, okay, the, the bank, the seller's bank is going to um, give the approval. So that's the main thing with us is that it just takes a little bit longer. Um, but that being said, that's a great question. So I have some questions for you that I get a lot, um, especially in this market. And I'm seeing, I'm pulling credit, you know, several times a day and I'm seeing things coming out coming up on people's credit. Um, and I'm hearing from people that are out of work and they're not able to make their payments. So if somebody is not able to make their mortgage payments, um, what can they do? Well, the first thing they should do is they should call their mortgage company. So whether it's a bank or whatever financial institution that they're dealing with and tell them that tell the bank that they can't make that mortgage payment and figure out if there is some other solution whether it's going to be they're going to get you know two or three months of a break or they're going to get a forbearance agreement or they're going to look into doing a loan modification picking up the phone and actually conveying this information is very important and sometimes it's worthwhile calling a couple of times because you may get different answer and the second time you may get a more favorable answer but doing nothing is not the way to go you want to tell the bank I've lost my job or uh, I've had a great reduction in income because maybe of a divorce or a family uh, death in the family. So the bank needs to know and then come up with a solution as far as how you're going to move forward. But 
picking up that phone is very important and some people have uh, an issue with doing that or they feel like they're going to not get a resolution but picking up the phone call in the bank, conveying the information and see what kind of options the bank is going to give you as far as uh, moving forward. Right, now do they call the number, they're calling the number on their mortgage statement then? Yes, they'll call the number on the mortgage statement and sometimes there is a, a different department that handles, let's say loan modifications or forbearance agreement and they'll just get passed on to the right department. But the first, uh, the, the 1-800 number that's usually on the statement is where you start off. Okay, and now do they have to stop making their mortgage payment in order to get the loan modification? No, that is a big, big misconception. So you can continue making your mortgage payment and still apply for a loan modification. Typically, the bank wants to see hardship by you not paying that mortgage. However, it's not a requirement that you default in order to qualify for a loan modification. So again, picking up the phone, talking to the representatives to see what can be done. And sometimes they will tell you, you need to default on your mortgage, but that is not correct. I've had people do loan modifications who did not default on their mortgage. And also what it means that if you default, let's say you've defaulted for six months and that accounts for $8,000 plus fees, et cetera. It may mean that that $8,000 is gonna either be put at the end of the mortgage or it's gonna be included in the new uh, mortgage payment that you're gonna have once a loan modification is going to uh, um, be uh, reinstated or stated in the, um, let's say in month four or six, whenever you end up uh, making a mortgage payment again. So it's not like the months that you did not pay are going to be forgiven. In the peak of the recession, some um, amounts were forgiven. Nowadays, I'm not seeing that. So if you don't pay the mortgage for the next number of months, you're going to end up paying that whether it's through the life of the loan or whether it's going to be tagged at the end of the uh, loan and you're going to be required to make a payment um, as a lump sum payment or a balloon payment as they call it. Okay, so then let me ask, what is the difference between a loan forbearance or a loan modification or is there a difference? Yes, there is a difference. So a loan modification, the bank is going to look at your income your expenses, they're going to value the property, and they're going to figure out what is your new mortgage payment going to be. So let's say you were paying $1,500 a month, and once they do their uh, review, the bank will say, okay, you're going to have a mortgage payment of $1,000 a month, and we're going to extend the life of the loan, and also going to reduce the interest. So let's say you were paying 4%, the bank says, okay, your, your interest rate going forward will be 325 so that's a loan modification. They're taking the original loan, you went from a $1,500 payment to $1,000 a month from a 4% interest rate to let's say 3.25. A forbearance, when you are having a financial distress and you call a bank and say, I need three months where I'm allowed not to make my payment and this is the situation I'm facing. And the bank will review some documentations that they will ask you for and they'll say, okay, we will give you three months off. Now that three months that you haven't paid, again, is not gonna be forgiven. They may say, you're gonna have to pay it come January 1st of 2021, or you have to pay it in six months. So modification, uh, there's a, a structural change on the mortgage, whereas the forbearance, you're just getting some time to basically get back on your feet and be able to start making that mortgage payment again. So there's a major difference between the two. Yeah. And it's a loan modification. Um, there were people that got principal reductions. Those don't really happen anymore. Um, it could be a really a major change as far as your mortgage payment and being able to afford and save that property from foreclosure or from a short sale. Now with the modification, let's say someone was paying $1,500 a month or going down to a thousand. So that's a $500 difference. Mm -hmm. Is that $500 forgiven or is that getting tacked on somewhere? So typically what they do is they extend the life of the loan. So let's say you got a loan, uh, you bought a house and got a loan in 2010 and you've been paying for 10 years and you had some issues during the COVID and you couldn't pay. What they will do when they do a loan modification, they will start the loan from the beginning in 2020. So they will extend it, say, 
from a 30-year loan to a 40-year loan or a 35-year loan. So that $500 amount that you're not paying anymore, two things can happen to it. It could be stretched over the lifetime of the loan or because the interest rate has been reduced, you're not having to pay that $500 because that's how much of your payment was interest. And then sometimes what they do is they'll take part of the mortgage and let's say you didn't pay your mortgage and it was $20,000. They will extend the life of the loan. Now you're starting over, you have a 40 year mortgage and then the amount is tagged on in the end. That's where they say, when you make your last final payment, you will pay 20,000 or 30, mm -hmm. depending what it is. So um, it just is going to depend on the restructuring of the loan and how much reduction you're going to get in uh, interest that could bring your payment from, let's say, 1500 to 1000 Right. One of the things I want to point out here that is extremely important for anybody that's talking about forbearance or loan modification, especially if they're looking to buy a home in the future, maybe they know they only have a year left you know, in one area and they're going to go to another, move to another area and they want to buy a home. Well, I have seen in the past um, and some people had no idea that the lender would agree to the modification or agree to the forbearance. And this is also with cars, credit cards, whatever, but is still marking them late on the mortgage. I mean, on the credit. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure anybody that is looking to do a modification or a forbearance, if credit is very important to you for whatever reason, just make sure and see if you can get it in writing. I don't know if that's a possibility, um, but I have, you know, clients coming to me now wanting to buy a home and unfortunately we can't do anything because of the mortgage late um, or credit card late or car late or whatever. And they tell me, well, the lender told me that they weren't going to mark me late. So, you know, that's been an issue that I've been seeing. So what if somebody had a loan modification back in 2010? Are they able to do another loan modification at this time? Yes, the lender essentially is just going to review the financial information again. And if you qualify under their criteria, let's say there is a, a, a great reduction in your income or the value of the property has decreased, they will do an evaluation. And if you are, if you qualify, they will offer you another loan modification. So a lot of people think I got a loan modification. I cannot get another one. That is not true. I've had clients actually get a couple of loan modifications because of different things that happened in their life that they lost their job or there was a, a, a you know, a, the, somebody was sick in their home and they were spending a lot of their uh, assets toward paying for medical care. So it is definitely possible to apply again um, if people have lost their jobs or they're going through a divorce, et cetera, where the bank is going to um, be able to provide some assistance. And by calling is the only way that they will find out and going through the process. And just because you apply and get denied does not mean that you cannot reapply again. So if you apply, let's say in May and you get a response in June or July that says you were denied, there's there's nothing preventing you from applying again in September or August. Um, because for example, you may have had an increase in income in June and July, which would make it feasible for you to keep that home when you apply in, uh, in September. So don't, don't hold back of uh, thinking, oh, I didn't get approved, so I can't apply again. You sure can. Now, would you suggest um, somebody using an attorney like yourself to handle the modifications, or is this something that they can do on their own? Um, doing loan modifications, you have to be extremely diligent. So can they be done on, on uh, can an, a homeowner do it on their own? Absolutely. They just really have to push and push and push because things with the banks, as you can imagine, if you have a great number of loan modifications being submitted at the same time because of COVID right now and many, many people losing their jobs or they didn't have any income for a couple of months, there will be a delay. And the only way to get these applications pushed forward is if you're diligent. You call, you make sure you have records of when you send documentations. And that's where a lot of people unfortunately fail. They say, oh, I called the bank. They never called me back. Well, you have to keep calling. Yeah. So, some people can do it on their own. A lot for a lot of people is difficult. So hiring an attorney uh, or going to um, like a counseling agency that does not charge is a, is a way of doing it to be able to get that loan modification that you want in order to keep that home for your family. Yeah. 
Okay, so last question for you. Um, let's say that they've exhausted their options. They tried the, mo the modification. They're still out of work. They still can't, you know, just they can't do it. The next option would be a short sale, right? So it depends. If the house has equity, there is no need for short sale. True. And so the difference, so people know what the short sale is. Let's say that you owe um, 200,000 on the mortgage, but the house is worth 300,000. If you have no other option, you are not getting a loan modification, you have no way of paying for this mortgage, you can simply sell the home and you don't need the bank's approval because you have that equity of 100,000. Right. But the reverse, if the house is worth 200,000, but the mortgage is 300,000 and you have no way of paying for this home, then a short sale would be an option of trying to sell this property without going through a foreclosure. And that's where the bank has to step in and approve it to allow you to sell it for $100,000 less than you owe. Okay. Right. So on the loan part, just to kind of interject here real quick, um, yeah. it, you know, people might say, well, why would I want to do a short sale? Let's just let it go into foreclosure. Um, and if you're trying to get another loan um, in the future, the seasoning between the time that you short sale the property and the time that you're able to buy another home is shorter than if you were to go into foreclosure. The seasoning on a foreclosure from the time you foreclose on the property until the time you're able to get another home is about three years longer, depending on the program, um, the loan program. Um, so it is a better idea to short sale if you can. Um, and that's something that you help clients with in determining what's gonna be the best option for them, modification, forbearance, or short sale. Right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And you want to avoid foreclosure. Foreclosure that means there is a lawsuit. You've been sued. Now you have to hire counsel. You have to defend yourself. If you don't defend yourself, you've given up a lot of rights. You, if you can avoid the foreclosure, you absolutely should. Um, and with a short sale, everything is being handled outside of the court system, and it's better on your credit. You don't have a lawsuit. You don't have to ever disclose that you were sued. So trying to stay outside the court system is the best thing if you can avoid it. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but being proactive, picking up the phone. And if you have um, made, if you come to the realization that there is no way of saving this home, putting on a market, you need a realtor in order to do a short sale. A bank yeah. is not going to allow you to do it sell by owner. Yeah, I back in the day when I sold real estate and back in 2009, that was what I did. I listed short sales. That was like how I got myself like out of that recession um, by listing short sales. So there is a lot that goes into it. It's not a traditional listing. I would definitely recommend working with somebody that knows how to list short sales um, because, you know, they need to you know, know how to do it, know the different addendums and stuff like that, and then also be able to work with an attorney like you where you're going to make sure that everything is like getting through the system um properly because if like you said if you're not on top of them it could take a year i mean it could take longer it's it could take a long time i would say an efficient short sale process is probably four months contract to close yeah approval yeah, contract to approval yeah, and it depends on the client, how quickly they can get documents, do they right. own businesses. So you are right, they they can take a long time. And you know, having somebody that pushes you along to submit the documentation can get the approval quicker rather when the homeowner is just kind of waiting for the bank to reach out to them. And the banks are overwhelmed. They have so many of them going on. But the house is your house and it's your responsibility. If you don't pay, the bank will sue you. They have right. a contractual right. Yeah. So, well, that's pretty much it. Was there anything else that you wanted to say or kind of bring up or point out? Be diligent, pick up the phone, don't be embarrassed. Everybody at some point in their life is going through a, a financial hardship. So if when it comes to not being able to pay the mortgage, call the banks. If you're looking to refinance, talk to Danielle, see if it makes sense and, um, see what you can save your family because there are expenses every month people pay that they don't even realize they're paying until somebody actually points it out or can say, look, we can save you this much. Do you wanna um, look at this option and uh, run the numbers for you? So right. and thank you again, this was wonderful. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And if you need any advice, um, please reach out to Anita. I will make sure that all of her information um, is in this Facebook post afterwards. And like I said in the beginning, we will be reaching out to anybody that um, had some questions on Facebook Live. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to, you know, talk to you individually. Um, and we want to be a resource. So we really appreciate you watching. Thank you so much. And everybody have a great Thursday. Bye. Bye.